Control. Welcome. わが戦艦は銀河の妖精ミスシェリブの来訪を心より歓迎する海If Macro Zero was a subtle celebration of the 20th anniversary of the Macro's franchise, for the quarter century mark, Shoji Kawamori and the satellite crew pulled out all the stops and gave us one of the best entries ever. I'm talking about the magnificent Macro's Frontier, a new show that celebrated the 25th anniversary of the original Super Dimension Fortress Macro's. Set over a decade after what happened in Macro 7, Macro's Frontier tells the story of the 25th new Macro's class colonial fleet, the Macro's Frontier, who's moving towards the galactic center, yet it encounters a new enemy, the insectoid biomechanical alien known as the Vajra. For me, Macro's Frontier is a very different kind of beast, both in terms of storytelling and in mechanical design. For starters, gone are the experimental fighters with forward swept wings or stealth configurations as here we have a much more traditional looking jetcraft, the BF-25 Messiah. And while traditional, it's absolutely amazing, a direct evolution of the original BF-1 that also adds the modernism of the BF-0 seen in the previous series. Also, back again are the songstresses, with the galactic fairy Cheryl Gnome and the up-and-coming Rankali. But more importantly, the story is a little bit inspired by what happened in the first space war, with the alien species reacting to music, a rookie pilot in the middle of a love triangle and even the Skull Squadron. And when I say inspired, I truly mean inspired, as this is not a soft reboot nor anything like that. The Macros chronology has been going on uninterrupted since the 80s, with characters that appear in the first series still having important parts in the latter series. Like Maximilian Genius, but he's special, he's a genius. So no, Frontier is not a reboot, it's still part of the overall Macros timeline, but to be honest, you really don't need much, if any, backstory to get into this series. Everything is nicely explained and particularly in this story, there is no direct character connection to previous one, but there are a lot of references, some being subtle and others being super blatant like the color scheme of Altus Valkyrie and even the Skull Squadron, even though that one has an in-story justification. Back to the story, if looked from above, it's actually a pretty simple story. The frontier against the Vajras until they find out what the Vajras really are. But looked from within, there are many conspiracies and super interesting plot twists with every thread answered and none left dangling. Except the love triangle. That would be addressed until the movies. And the fact that I say that the story is simple at first, with a complex background, is actually a good thing, as it leaves more time for character growth and action sequences. And speaking of which, the action here is amazing. The whole mechanical and biomechanical design is done with great care. The Vajras come in different sizes and all of them look very menacing. But the stars of the show are definitely the Valkyries, specifically the Messiahs. And if you ask me, Osma's Ardmore Messiah is one of the greatest designs ever and I hope that the Machinations relaunches that choking, but I digress. Anyway, I really liked Frontier's story and unlike Macro 7, this story actually aged very well and contrary to Zero, it's much more grandiose in scope. In fact, this story was so well received that it got a two film adaptation that as expected from a Macros film, changed quite a lot of things. In today's video, I won't talk about the films, since they can't really be considered compilation movies as they have their own chronology and events. So my friends, I'm Absa, and let's get ready to take a deep dive into one of the greatest Macros entries ever. The one that in fact set the new path and tone that the franchise would adopt for the future. And, as usual, I'll divide this exploration in two parts, first the story and then the mechanical design. And obviously, potential spoilers ahead. Uh, 
As I said before, the story is simplish, but at the same time rife with references to previous series and a complex intertwining background. We may even consider it a modernization of the first human centron conflict, with human leaders not as noble as Captain Bruno Global and the Vajra serving as a more brutal, yet not quite evil, alien species. Kind of like what a centrality would be if you remove all of the human elements. Would humanity still interact with aliens even if they didn't look like us nor communicated like us? Would we still be peaceful? In Macro Zero, the conflict was, for the most part, humans against humans. In Seven, the Proto Devlin still used humans as a vessel to communicate and gather spirit. In Plus, it was an AI who obtained human like consciousness. And even in the original Super Dimension Fortress macros, the Centrari were revealed to be like 99% similar to us humans. So, when realizing that, a very big effort was made to stop the fight. But what happens when the enemy is stripped of all of its humanity with no single element that relates to us? They're monstrous looking, vicious machines that destroy everything in sight and move in hordes that can travel through space without anything stopping them. Can we even consider the option of peace if there's no way to communicate with them? And if peace is not an option, could we coerce them to be used as a super weapon? That's the premise of Macro's Frontier. A story that mirrors the original human centered war, but with a super interesting twist that involves humanity's hubris. But let's move two steps back. The previous statement of controlling the enemy is something that I can say now that I have already seen the whole series, because as I was watching it, the whole Bajra conspiracy develops very slowly and is really pushed towards the end of the series. But it's definitely worth the wait, since the whole intrigue regarding the Vajras, Ranka's past and the Frontier sister unit the Macros Galaxy is super super interesting and something that the franchise, to my knowledge, had never done before, at least not to this level. And before I move on to something else, let me briefly talk about the story in a more concise way. It's the year 2059, and the Macros Frontier, one of the many colonization fleets heading towards the center of the galaxy, is in search of a new home to set. However, during a mission to an unexplored asteroid belt, a reconnaissance new UN Space PF-171 is destroyed by an extremely powerful alien species known as the Vajra, which immediately begin their attack on the rest of the fleet. Unable to stop the new enemy threat, the Nuns authorizes the deployment of the private military organization called the SMS Strategic Military Services, with its ace unit, the Skull Squadron, which utilizes the new BF-25 Messiah variable fighter to combat the new alien menace. Tragically, one alien is able to penetrate the frontier and kills a Messiah pilot, but Here's where we get to see our main character, Alto Saotome, in action. He boards the jetcraft and manages to stop the threat all while protecting Rankali, another main character who would be crucial for the understanding of the Bachelor threat and the love interest antagonist of Cheryl Noon, the songstress of this era from the Macros Galaxy. Funny thing is, both girls share a very, very close past. Not exactly them, but their parents and their research interests, but more of that later. The stories of Alto, Cheryl and Ranka, along with the Skull Squadron, the manager of Cheryl and even the survivors of the Macros Galaxy and the government of the frontier intertwine amidst the Vajra attacks on the Macros frontier. And slowly but surely, the story begins unraveling a very dark and cruel conspiracy that manages to link the truth of the Vajra species, the protocultor's aphos, and even humanity's next step of evolution. Now, what truly stands out from Frontier's story is that even though it sounds super complex, it's really not so, and fortunately, there are no slow nor messy information dump episodes. Everything is super well delivered with a good measure of dogfights and obviously songs. Now, as I said before, the story is simple. 
simplish but with a very complex backdrop. On the surface level, we have the main conflict between the nuns and the SMS against the alien Vajur, with most of the first part of the series focusing on that, yet hinting at something else. As the series progresses, we find out that the Vajras are only a fraction of a tremendous conspiracy that involves the Macros Galaxy, Cheryl, her manager Grace and her bodyguard Brera, Ranka and her mother, a frontier high officer and even something that resembles the Aphos from Macros Seer. That conspiracy part is absolutely amazing and captivating as it brings a level of politicking and intrigue not seen in previous entries. Ok, so now I'm going to start to talk about it, so this is your final spoiler warning before all hell breaks loose. I'm not going to talk about what happens in Macros Frontier per se, I'm only going to explain the conspiracy in chronological order instead of the non-linear fashion way that's presented on the story. But yeah, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers ahead. <laughs> The Vajras are an ancient species who, while complex as a whole macro-organism that operates via collective consciousness, individually they are simple life forms, simpler than a human at least. They have no language and communicate with each other through fold space, utilizing fold quartz inside their B-type microorganisms in their blood. This communication method also keeps the Vajra in constant contact as a ubiquitous supernetwork across space. Now, the protocol knew of the Vajra and, while fearful, they desired their instant communication and transportation powers, so they started a project that would imitate them. That's how the protocol invented or discovered space fault technology, super dimension weaponry and remember the Aphos from Macro Zero? Well, that being that almost destroyed the UN Spacey and the anti-UN alliance was an entirely mechanical imitation of the Bajra Queen. Mao Num from the Mayan Islands survived the Aphos attack and, wanting to find her missing sister, became one of the pioneering researchers of the protoculture. She was also the key scientist researching the miraculous substance known as Fold Quartz. A couple of years before Frontier's story began, a research fleet was sent to investigate the Vajra, the effects of the Fold Quartz and the V-type virus. Said research team was headed precisely by Dr. Mao Nom and Ranche Mei, who had brought her children Ranka and Brera and, on behalf of the Macros Galaxy fleet, Grace O'Connor. Some time later, the fleet was suddenly ambushed by the Vajra while settled on Gallia IV. This event marked the beginning of the Vajra War and, since it was an ambush, there were a lot of casualties, but among the few notable survivors was Rank, who was rescued by my man Osma Lee. Grace O'Connor continued the research on the V-type infection in the galaxy fleet, using Mao Nom's granddaughter Cheryl Nome as the test subject codenamed Fairy 9, all while manufacturing Cheryl's entire idol status for her purposes. So what's the V-type virus? Well, since the Vajra lack the ability to communicate with other intelligent organisms directly, they have attempted to solve this problem by infecting other organisms with the B-type microorganisms that they use, since, in theory, living organisms that are infected with the B-type microbe have the potential to transmit and receive fold waves through superdimension space. The problem is that the V-type microbe can result in the deaths of intelligent organisms if the infection spreads to the brain. So yeah, good luck Cheryl. Dr. Mao Nom was aware of that, so she tried to formulate a successful treatment for it. Yet, she was only able to come up with a solution that involved receptor blockers in fixed intervals to slow the virus progression. But unbeknownst to everyone, there was a living and thriving V-type virus bearer, 
Ranka Li. Since Ranka was conceived in utero with the V-type microbe, she was able to maintain the microorganisms safely within her abdomen her whole life. And like I said before, this granted her the use of fold waves when she sank. This meant that Ranka Li was the first intelligent being able to communicate with the Vajra. Moving a little bit back in time, remember that the Vajras ambushed the research fleet on Gallia 4? Well, it was Ranka's singing that summoned the Vajras. The problem was that nobody knew that, so the Vajra were perceived as enemies that meant harm to everyone. Talk about a cruel twist of fate. Anyway, Grace's true goal is to keep investigating the V-type virus infected so that she'll be able to acquire the Vajra's fault communication network and control the galaxy. But she's not alone. Her conspiracy crew is composed by Leon Mishima, Frontier's chief of staff and fiancé to the president's daughter and Brera Stern. Yes, the same Brera, brother of Ranka, who's now a cyborg under the complete control of Grace. And why is this important? Well, because everything in Macro's Frontier is super tightly connected. Except Alto. Leon's fiancé is Kathy, who is Osmali's ex, with him being Ranka's surrogate big bro and the skull leader of the SMS. Grace is directly connected with Cheryl first by being her manager and second by Cheryl being Mao's granddaughter, her superior researchers from way back. Finally, this leaves us with the poor Vajra, a misunderstood alien who wanted to communicate with other species but killed everyone when they transmitted their language via the V-type virus. And yes, this is more or less only the backdrop of the series as the intrigue keeps on escalating until the final conflict. That's why I say that this series is super well constructed, with everything falling in place episode after episode and nothing feeling pulled out of thin air. Except Alto. The problem with Alto is that he kind of represents the audience, so he is there just by quote unquote pure luck and well, obviously his persistence. He accidentally comes across the Messiah in the first episode and given the fact that he left his acting career to fly, he takes this as a signal to become a pilot. And Ranka and Cheryl develop feelings for him because of reasons? Yeah, I don't know, the Alto connection is the the weakest of all. I mean, it is there, it's just a little bit weak and he's definitely no Hikaru Ichijo. The love triangle is also there between Ranka, Cheryl and Alto, and while it is present all through the series and really doesn't feel that forced, it's actually the least impressive part of Frontier and in my humble opinion it's nowhere near as compelling as the Misa Minmei Ichijo love triangle of Super Dimension Fortress Macros. But it's not bad by any means, it just goes to show you that the whole Vashra conspiracy is absolutely amazing, a great improvement over the original human centered war and the proto-devlin conflict. And even though I have already heavily spoiled certain parts, the ending I won't spoil. I don't want to deprive you from that experience. The ending obviously has something to do with the final conflict between the Vajra and the Battle Frontier with the SMS, but how it happens? Wow! Let's just say that not in a million years was I expecting a certain song to be used in that way. So yeah, it's not an overstatement when I say that my jaw literally dropped. I'll conclude this part by saying that the series and the movies play out very differently, with many people preferring the movies. Yet, I'm a little bit more partial to the series as I feel that the conspiracy is much more rooted in human hobbies. Macro's Frontier has a very well crafted story and you understand more things with every rewatch. The Vajra were an interesting enemy, a super fresh spin to the formula that mirrors the original centrality and their inability to process music but turned around by them being unable to understand normal communication and only understanding music. Kawamori and his crew did an amazing job with how this new enemy is quote unquote affected by music. 
all in all, Macro's Frontier is a super interesting story with great music done by Yoko Kano and amazing visual spectacle regarding the Valkyrie fights. And speaking of Valkyries, let's finish this exploration by looking at the gorgeous mechanical design. It's no secret that I like jet transforming robots. From the Sega Gundam to the original Valkyrie going all the way to Star Saver. And even though the BF1 will always have a special place in my heart as the first mech that I saw that transformed and actually got me into anime way back when, the BF25s are absolutely brutal. Inspired by the original Valkyries from 25 years ago, they are the epitome of function and aesthetics. Kawamori did a great great job at modernizing the silhouette of the original blocky Valkyrie by adding longer and rounder shapes and making the specific robot parts merge in the fighter mode in a much more invisible way. I'll even go ahead and say that the fighter mode of the Messiah is probably my favorite silhouette of the whole Valkyrie series, with a close second being the Durandal and the Siegfried. Yet I can't say the same for the Batroid mode. You see, the newer BF-25s look much more skinny than their previous counterparts, and it becomes obvious once you see them side by side in the fighter mode. The BF-1's blocky shape contributes to the massive chest and shoulders of the Batroid, while the BF-25's sleeker silhouette makes the whole torso look slimmer. Do I prefer one over the other? That's a super hard question since both have their charm. Now, I'll talk a little bit later about why did Kawamori design the Messiah's Batroid mode that skinny, but in story, that variable fighter was being developed in a very harsh war time, so they needed to have room for extra armaments and protection, with those add-ons bulking up the silhouette. Going further, in fact, the first time that we see the Messiahs is with Skull Leader Osma Lee and his BF-25S is equipped with armored parts, and also his crewmate piloting the BF-25F has it equipped with the super parts. So yeah, it seems that from the very beginning the Messiah was thought of as the perfect vessel for add-ons and extra equipment, going all the way to being the first Valkyrie that can shift between modes with extra parts still attached. That, by the way, it's also shown in the first episode, specifically with Osma's armored Messiah. Officially, Shoji Kawamori states that the BF-25 is a deliberate move away from the passive stealth style silhouettes that dominated the current real-world fighters. He also notes that since this is the first major Valkyrie that transforms in all modes with its armor parts still attached, he gave the unarmored fighter a slim profile. In his words, the BF-25 resembles a slimmer BF-1 Valkyrie in fighter mode, but transforms like a BF-19 Excalibur. And if Kawamori went in a familiar direction for the Messiah, for the Lucifer he went to the complete opposite side. The BF-27 Gamma Valkyrie is super alien looking with a very different fighter silhouette and a bold red magenta color scheme not seen since Vassara's BF-19. The Lucifer is a design that slowly grows on you. At first I didn't like it as it looks super weird, particularly in Batroid mode, with its hoof-like fit turbines and the super Eva inspired face. But then you see its firepower and how it moves almost three times faster than Alto's unit and you remember that red robots are super cool. Yes, Brera and the Lucifer are Kawamori's attempt at a char clone. More specifically, a cyber new tape char clone with Brera being a cyborg with fuzzy memories piloting a red Valkyrie that outperforms the others. It's a very subtle nod to the Gundam franchise that Kawamori is known to like, but since it's really well done, it doesn't feel like a cheap copy. Anyway, this video has been going on for way too long, so yeah, the Ardmore Messiah and the Lucifer, absolutely great mobile suits, I'm sorry, absolutely great Valkyries with in-story justifications for every design element. I really like them, and if you follow me on Instagram, you'll definitely see more Valkyrie pictures. 
And as for what comes next, well, as I said before, not only did the movies change the story, but also added new Valkyrie designs from the extra equipment for the BF-25, you know, the tornado pack, to the new YF-29 Durandal, a completely new Valkyrie that redefines and modernizes the forward swept wing look made famous by Isamu's YF-19. But the movies, False Songstress and Wings of Goodbye are for another video. I think that it's not an overstatement when people say that Frontier is the best macro series ever. It's a solid story with great mecha and character design and absolutely amazing action scenes. And also, I think that it may be the gateway to the macro universe, even more so than Do You Remember Love. It's a great piece of fiction that more or less explains everything you need to know to understand it, but also rewards you with subtle references to previous entries of the franchise and even Gundam. Thankfully, the license issue has already been solved and we'll be able to enjoy this series without recurring to expensive imports and or unofficial sources. I really believe that Big West should make at least this series available for streaming. In that way, it'll be accessible to the largest number of people and with that, then it'll be easier to convince more Microns into the franchise. But tell me, what's your experience with Macros Frontier? Did you like the story? or do you prefer the movies? Also, hashtag Team Ranka or hashtag Team Cheryl. I'm obviously Team Cheryl, but hey, we can still be friends if you prefer Ranka. And as you may or may not know, my name is Absa, and you can continue the conversation over at Twitter, where you can follow me at Absalonicas, and on Instagram, where I post pictures of my figures, my cats, and sometimes even myself. I'll be trying to talk more about anime, comics, and mechanical design via model kits. Until next time, always remember that in fiction lies power, so let's use it to forge a new type of story, our hero's journey. <laughs>